As you know, Mr. Zhao was the treasurer at National Bank, so uh, we'll be able to have uh, really pointed answers. And well, first, we're talking about Quebec today. What's going on in Quebec? I mean, I live in Quebec. It seems like, you know, it's booming. There's a lot of construction in Montreal. And then we saw the last numbers for Q2. It was uh, standing out uh, from the rest of Canada on various fronts, including business investment. Can, how do you explain this? How is, uh, how is Quebec doing and what's going on? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, we've been growing at 2.7% for the first six months of the year. Uh, that's way above what we had predicted uh, in our last budget. We had a forecast of 1.8%, and we will, uh, by mathematics, we will have to uh, revise that up. Uh, we, have our, we have a new government. We have a very ambitious economic agenda, a clear path of where we're going. We want more private investment more labor supply, we want to reduce that, we have a balanced budget, and we have a focus on education. We, we strongly believe that human capital is very much part of what we need uh, to grow faster. So you said that's what you wanted, but what, what's going on? So what, what do you see? Is this, where's the biggest surprise? Was it the business investment, which was quite robust? Uh, the, the, the business confidence, the, the climate is really good. So the, the, we have positive contribution from all components. Consumption, uh, the labor market is very solid. For the first time, we have the lowest unemployment rate uh, in Canada. Uh, we introduce measures to stimulate uh, uh, private investment with accelerated depreciation. So that's also doing well. We, we're increasing public infrastructure spending, which is also an important component of uh, productivity uh, by 15%. We have fiscal measure to bring uh, experienced worker back into the workforce. We're reducing payroll taxes for businesses that want to hire experienced workers. So we're all aligned uh, and we have a very clear agenda, an ambitious economic agenda. Uh, it's clear, it's simple, and it increased business confidence and to the benefit of all Quebecers. So how, how, what's the growth you're expecting for this year now? Uh, we will revise our forecast on November 7. We have a, a, an economic update. So uh, all I would commit to say now is that it will be higher than our previous forecast okay, of 1.8%. We have the forecast right there. So probably going to not be so far than uh, from, from 2018. I've noticed that private uh, sector forecasts are in the neighborhood of 2.3%. And uh, same thing for next year, are you also optimistic that this can extend into next year? Uh, actually, everything that we do is for the long term. Uh, our role is to make sure that we, uh, Quebec has been underperforming Canada for a long time. If you look at the past 10 years, uh, our productivity rate was lower than Ontario, than the Canadian average. And what we want to do is be in a position to outperform for the next 25 years. So we have structural fundamental policy for the long term. And our impact, if, if we are a good government and we do well and we realize what we want to achieve, we will increase potential GDP of Quebec by half a percent for 25 years. And that's what you need to do to catch up with the Canadian average with Ontario, for example. So looking at more of the short term, yes. um, you know, the last question before was about risk of a recession in Canada over the next 12 months. Do you see any? Uh, there's, I see, every, every time I look at, I, I don't give point estimate, I see probability distribution, and, and of course the probability of a, of a recession is, is not uh, nil. Uh, so uh, the probability that we will keep growing is higher than the probability of a recession, and that's good. And even if there is a slowdown, uh, and we're witnessing a synchronized global slowdown right now, but still, we, we need to work on the structural aspect of the economy for the long term. And we have room, we have the fiscal capacity to help if there is a slowdown. So I'm not going to give you a forecast. The distribution of a recession is anywhere maybe between 10 and 40 percent, and everybody has its own point estimate. Uh, but I'm focused on the long term. And if there is a slowdown, we have the tools uh, to provide some support. So let, let's look at these tools. So you have the uh, stabilization fund, yes. which is not a stash of money you can really uh, take from, but it, you could reasonably, uh, you know, you have this uh, margin for maneuver. My understanding is that it's gotten even bigger after the larger than expected surplus last year, which it might even be bigger once you announce the final number next month. But how much do you have at the moment in your stabilization fund? Well. 
This is a very uh, knowledgeable audience, uh, fixed income conference. Uh, the stabilization fund is a very technical concept. It is, and, and I'll try to sum it up for you, it is the sum of past surpluses. And so there is zero correlation between past surpluses and future deficit. So we are trying to uh, de-link those two things. The fact that we had surpluses in the past is good. We are reducing our debt to GDP. We're, we have a law. We're on a downward trend. We want to be by 2024 at the same net debt to GDP level as the federal government. So we're going to keep doing this. If there is a recession, uh, we will provide, on, in addition to the structural things that we do, we would provide direct stimulus in order to help buffer the economic impact. And, and the way we could do this is by, for example, giving money directly uh, to citizens. Or if we favor more uh, long-term effect, we could increase uh, infrastructure spending. And to what, what sort of room do you have to do that? How much would you be able to Well, stimulate? for example, right now, when we predict a, a fiscal balance over the next five years, that's uh, after contribution contributing to the generation fund. So in fact, we have an accounting surplus of $3 billion over the five-year horizon. So th the first thing that would happen is that this accounting surplus would be reduced. That's, right. that's our yeah. margin. Okay. And uh, so, you know, in the past, Quebec has this law that it has to balance its budget. Yes. But except in exceptional circumstances, like a recession, et cetera. But do you feel like at this stage, because of the past surpluses, Quebec would be in a position to stimulate without going back into deficit? Uh, the answer is yes, but depending on the uh, nature of the slowdown. Every recession is different. What we need to do is we need to be in a position for all circumstances. If there is a need to stimulate directly, we will be in a position to provide money directly to uh, individual. Uh, if it is a mild slowdown, we have a capacity to absorb this because of our good fiscal position. Uh, in terms of the uh, medium term, we will reach our uh, target by law of debt reduction uh, earlier than projected, and we will provide an update on the exact timing uh, when we do this. But in the last budget, we showed that we would meet the gross debt target of 45% by 2022, the sum of the deficit target by 2024, if you exclude the stabilization reserve. So there's been a lot of pride on your part, you know, on to the fact that the debt has been going down and also the borrowing cost of um, Quebec compared with Ontario have been, you know, slightly below. Um, so what does that leave? Like, Quebec is the good student these days, right? It's, it's uh, the, the history is behind now, it seems. What does that leave Quebec in the sense of, talks of um, equalization in Canada because you know, the formula is not going to change for a few years, but the goal is to make Quebec richer. Uh, there's a lot of angst on the other side of the country about this system. So you're getting richer, you're getting better students. Shouldn't that show into the equalization formula? Uh, it will, it, and it already has. And, and in fact, when you think of Quebec, you, you, you think of these two numbers. So we're 23% of the population of Canada but only 19% of, of its economy. So what we want to do by providing this extra half a percent to potential GDP, we want to go from 1.3, 1.4% to 2% potential GDP. If we achieve that over 25 years, we will be 15% more rich and we will have achieved the desire to close the gap with the Canadian average and with Ontario. And so over these 25 years, we will go from uh, a lot of 65% uh, of total equalization payment to zero. It, it, all these things are connected as we, are, as we succeed in increasing potential GDP, as we increase productivity, as we outperform, keep outperforming like we've been doing for the last two years. As we do this over the long term, we will receive less equalization payment. Okay, but, but gradually. Exactly. You're not going to wait 25 years to change the formula. It, it's happening already. We are, we're going, on our fiscal plan, we're going from 65% of the program to 60. Once we hit 60, we'll go from 60 to 50. And uh, we're on the downward trajectory. We're working on this. Every day, we're focused on improving the wealth of Quebecers. So you're talking long-term measures. 
Um, do you feel there's some concerns about some economists, former central bank officials, about the fact that this campaign, this federal campaign, is not touching enough on long-term growth and what Canada needs to do, and it's all short-termist? Is that a concern you share? Uh, I have a lot to say today, but very little about the federal <laughs> election. <laughs> Uh, it's not, it's not a I wish party everybody party. well, and I'll be happy to work with whoever's the next finance minister. I have an excellent relationship with uh, Mr. Molno. So, but it, <laughs> <laughs> there's no, there's no, I mean, nothing that worries you. It's no, it's transport, it's cross parties, right? It's the fact that no one seems to really focus on the long term. Well, you're right then. Uh, for example, I met a senior economist of a very important bank here in New York, and I, I, I told them, our story, what we're doing, that we're focusing on the labor supply, on private investment, on infrastructure, reducing debt. Education is very much part, human capital is very much part of the answer. And his comment was, wow, you're the only government that's focusing on the structural aspect, on the supply side of the economy. So we're really proud of this and we're going to keep working on this. And we're really aligned. It's the economy minister, the finance minister, the premier, the education minister. The education minister is a very important part of our government. We have a lot to do in terms of graduation rate, of, of having more engineers, better educated workforce. So you want to, you know, att attract more people to Quebec. One of the main um, arguments has been that Quebec is a cheaper province to move your, your headquarters to or, or your staff, especially tech companies. Now, I live in Montreal. I'm trying to buy a condo right now. I've been trying for a year. It's really hard. We're 10 people bidding on the same place. So I can tell you from first-hand experience about what the um, housing market is like. Prices, especially on the island, are rising really rapidly. Are you happy just because you're catching up, or is that something you think you should keep an eye on? Well, just to give ballpark figure, like the, the median house price in Montreal used to be a third of, of the of the price in Vancouver and half of the price in Toronto. So we're all performing economically for the last two years and this is showing into the housing market. So the fact that house prices are going up in Montreal is just, a, uh, is just a sign, a reflection of how good the economy is. So that's good. We want more of that. Uh, there's been some concern about foreign buyers uh, in fact, the, we have less foreign buyers in 2019 as a proportion of total buyers than in 2018. So we're monitoring that. Uh, but Montreal is a very vibrant city, a lot of immigration, a lot of students. It's, it's normal when your economy is doing well that house prices are going up. So, so no, no tax inside, no reason for a tax. And no reason for a tax based on the numbers that we're seeing. We actually have less. Uh, foreign buyers than in 2019 than 2018. And, and still, uh, in terms of uh, absolute house price, Montreal is one of the few large cities in North America where your employees can buy a home if you set up your head office in Montreal. It's so it's very positive. Low house price, low household debt is very much a comparative advantage for Quebec. Well, do these numbers take into account new condo housing that are not going through the resale market? Because there's a lot of those and uh, foreigners tend to buy in downtown Montreal. Well, and, and, and it's, you, uh, you're asking me the same question I'm being asked in the house. It's interesting. <laughs> uh, some of these condos are precisely built for these buyers. Uh, I mean, the, the fact that uh, um, uh, right downtown, uh, penthouse are, 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 are being sold to uh, foreigners, perhaps they were built especially for that. Uh, so, so everybody's welcome. Uh, our role is, is the structural foundation of the economy. We're monitoring what's going on. Uh, house price, uh, we're going up uh, at low single digit increasing for many years. Now they're going up at five to 6% per year. And uh, foreign buyers represent less than 3% of buyers. So as long as Montreal keeps doing well, uh, we should expect house price to keep doing well. How about the rest of Quebec? Uh, you know, um, we know, we've heard, we've seen all the examples of labor shortage. I was yes. just driving on the um, 20 highway, it was, we're hiring about every second building. That's good. It's good, but they can't <laughs> find anyone, right? So uh, how, you know, how worried are you about that? Bringing 
people to these regions, bringing immigrants to these regions. Well, when you look at total labor shortage in Canada, our share in Quebec is about our demographic weight. So first of all, we seem to be talking a bit more about this than the rest of the country, uh, perhaps because the unemployment rate is lower. So the labor shortage, we're, we're, we're aware of this problem and we're attacking it. And every time we face a structural challenge, we're attacking it with two or three vectors. Because in public policy, you're never sure that what you're doing is going to have the impact you're expected. So the first thing that we do is we notice that uh, Quebecers retire earlier than the rest of Canada. So we're providing fiscal incentive for workers older than 60 years old to stay in the workforce. Second, we're providing uh, payroll taxes uh, credit or reduction of payroll tax credit to firms that are hiring experienced workers. So we want to increase the participation rate of workers that are 60 years and older. The other thing that we're doing is we're reforming our immigration system. We have a situation where second generation immigrants are doing fantastically well in Quebec and in Canada, and that's good. And, we're, and, and immigration is very much part of the success of Canada and Quebec. First generation immigrants are struggling in terms of jobs, in terms of getting their jobs uh, skill recognized, uh, in terms of having the time, the opportunity to learn French, because we're the society where we speak French in North America. So we will provide personalized path to every first generation immigrant coming to Quebec. So immigration, experienced worker is what we're targeting for the labor shortage. And we should mention though that Quebec has reduced the number of uh, economic immigrants it's going to take. We reduced, we were receiving 50,000 immigrants. We went down from 40,000 in order to, and increasing the budget in order to provide better uh, personalized path and we're increasing now next year. So by the third year, third or fourth year of our mandate we'll be back to where we were but with a better integration for immigration. You did get some pushback though from lots of associations and organizations that came to testify to the House. Yes. Um, don't you think that rather than integration, the, and you mentioned that, the problem of degrees not being recognized, be you, whether you be an engineer or a doctor, is really what the problem is today? Uh, like every complex problem, there's just not one thing, but definitely diploma recognition and uh, uh, um, personalized interest of, of a professional association is an issue and we're looking at that. So I have just uh, two minutes for a few questions about yes. debt. Um, so you've been buying down debt using the Generations Fund, which you, you described earlier. Uh, was that a one-off? It was a one-off and it's a risk management exercise. So when you're in government, if the economy slows down, your revenues are going to go down, your expense are going to go up, your pension fund liabilities are going to go up and the return on your generation fund is going to go down. So what we did is having witnessed 10 years of very good performance in uh, equity market and, and private equity and the like, we decided to, in a risk management exercise, to reduce our risk to an economic slowdown. So we took $10 billion, paid down debt. So you're not planning to do We're that? We're done. That's done. You're done. Yes. <laughs> What about um, bond in foreign currencies? You know, there's been talks about a panda bond for a long time, yes. or at least several years in Quebec. Is there any chance of that happening next year? Uh, of course, there's always a chance, and we, we don't reveal where we will issue, but we, we like to, the, the, we swap everything into Canadian dollar. We're a Canadian dollar, uh, princ uh, our principal currency is Canadian dollar. Uh, but we have regular program in euros and US dollar and all the other currencies are opportunistic. Is that more complicated with the renminbi? What, what's holding you back? Or what's uh, making you hesitate? We did it with my uh, former uh, employer, so uh, everything is possible. Uh, it's not more complicated. <laughs> it, it's, it's a question of uh, cost-benefit analysis. You, um, you almost completed your uh, bond financing program, is that right? Correct. And that's the tendency that Quebec has had to, to finish it early because of markets and is it? Well, is it one thing that I want to reassure the crowd here, uh, politicians do not get involved in the intricacies of uh, debt management. Okay? We have professional 
doing this. Uh, some of them are here today. Uh, Alain Bélanger has been working for many years. Uh, these people are professional. Uh, I found I find out about our issues probably uh, a day after you. Uh, so, so, so I'm very much about the, the, the framework, the five-year plan, reducing debt, balanced budget, uh, fiscal efficiencies, competitive market, uh, cost control, and we have professional doing debt management. Well, Mr. Chen, I think this is a wrap. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you very much.